Good evening. Welcome, everyone. I am Katia Vicalho. I am a professor at Federal University of Espírito Santo in southeast of Brazil. And I am a member of IBMS. And also I am a member of the Technical Committee in Geo Engineer Education of the International Society of Soil Mechanics and Geotechnical Engineers. And today I will do a very brief presentation of the webinar. And I'll show you a slide. Uh, in spec, we, we feel like, in spite of the impress developed in the area of unsaturated soil mechanics in the last decade, uh, undergraduate students are often taught only the two limits condition, complete dry or complete wet saturation soils. And we know that in geostructure exposed to environmental change, the moisture change uh, varies with a wide range, and the effects and the relevance of soil non saturated have been neglected and may be a cause of the, some gaps in the geotechnical knowledge and the practice. That's a challenge for engineers, and we want with the webinar to address the needs the benefits of introduce concepts and application of unsaturated soil mechanics to undergraduate course in civil or geotechnical geo-environment engineering. And the main topic of the webinar is teaching unsaturated soil mechanics at the undergraduate level. And the webinar has two parts. The first part is we are going to have five, three presentations. The first one is by Del Frederick. Uh, the title is Undergraduate Unsaturated Soil Mechanics for the Trends. And the second one is by Bernardo Caicedo. Uh, the title is The Centrifuge Modeling of Unsaturated Soils. What's new and what's missing? And the third one is John McCartney. He's going to talk about building an understanding of the impact of the transient flow process on the mechanical behavior of unsaturated soil. 
The second part, we are going to have questions and answers section with the participation of the audience. Uh, you can write also the questions in Portuguese or comments about this section, and with the participation, online participation of the speakers and the moderators. Uh, the moderators are Gilson, Professor Gilson de Tirana from the Federal University of Goiás, and me, and Gilson is going to introduce the first speaker, Professor Fredman. All right, good evening. Thank you all for uh, participating. Uh, welcome to the audience. Uh, like Katia just said, we have a very interesting uh, agenda tonight, very inter interesting program with uh, three renowned uh, researchers and professors in the general area of geotechnical engineering and that have um, uh, a lot of experience, uh, experience teaching and saturated soil mechanics. Uh, before I introduce you to our first speaker, um, Rafael, please share my screen. Uh, I'd like to um, invite you all to the Pan American Conference on the Saturated Soils. Uh, the conference starts next week on Friday with the short courses, and then on Monday uh, in the next week, after the next week. Uh, if you haven't registered yet, this is the website. We have uh, the conference is being held completely uh, in a remote condition uh, uh, online. Uh, of course, due to the situation with the pandemic. Uh, and thanks to that, we have had the opportunity to offer a, a very low registration fees because the costs are quite reduced in these conditions. But we still have a very good conference with a very strong technical program with a lot of uh, very inter interesting keynote lectures and state-of-the-art uh, presentations. So um, uh, I really encourage you to register and participate. It's going to be a great conference. Uh, so, uh, so our first speaker is Professor Del Fredlin. Uh, Professor Fredlin has uh, taught civil engineering at the University of Saskatchewan in Canada for 34 years, where he developed the unsaturated soils group for research into the fundamentals of uh, the fundamental behavior of unsaturated soils. Uh, his studies gained national and international renown, resulting in the writing of more than 400 research papers and the publication of two textbooks on saturated soil mechanics. Most of you who have uh, some uh, experience teaching saturated soil mechanics know how uh, valuable these books have been to, to our uh, teaching. Uh, he presently heads up the Golder Saturated Soils Group for the Saskatoon Office of Golder Associates. Professor Fredden has been the recipient of numerous awards. He is the, he's a companion of the Order of Canada and has been widely recognized within the geotechnical engineering profession. Um, having received the Leggett Award in Canada, the Terzaghi Award uh, from the American Society of, Soil, of Civil Engineers, the Merit, uh, Meritorious Award from the Canadian Council of Professional Engineers, and the Distinguished Research Award from the University of Saskatchewan, among other numerous awards. So um, thank you, Professor Fredlin, for um, being willing to participate in giving us uh, this presentation. Welcome. You have the floor. OK, share screen. Share screen. Oh, pull down. Screen two. Hello. Yeah, you want to minimize this? Okay. 
Okay, I um, assume that you can see my screen. Thank you for your introduction, Jilson. And uh, I have one half hour here, and I would like to present you with a challenge. Suppose that you were asked to explain the essentials of unsaturated soil mechanics in one hour and one hour lecture. I would like to ask what materials would you include and what would you leave out? Unsaturated soil mechanics is often dismissed as being too complex for undergraduate engineering students. And I would like to ask the question, is this criticism legitimate or is there another side to the story? I would like to present in simplified form what I feel are the essential concepts for a basic knowledge of unsaturated soil mechanics. So why is unsaturated soil mechanics not taught at most universities? Here are some of the common arguments raised. Number one, we often hear that unsaturated soil mechanics is simply too difficult. Number two, there are no unsaturated soil mechanics textbooks written for the undergraduate level. Argument number three, there is limited available time in our curriculum to teach unsaturated soil mechanics. And number four, codes and standards fail to provide clear recommendations for applying unsaturated soil mechanics. Number five, many university professors simply do not feel adequately trained to teach unsaturated soil mechanics. I hope to answer to some degree each of these excuses by the end of this lecture. There is one equilibrium condition related to the water phase that assists geotechnical engineers in establishing a linkage between field conditions, laboratory testing conditions, and subsequent analyses. It is the condition where the net moisture flux at the ground surface is zero. Under this condition, the pore water pressure line is linear and is tied to the location of the water table. This equilibrium condition applies for all soil types and is referred to as the hydrostatic stress state. It is noteworthy that while the equilibrium pore water pressure line is linear, the quantification of the amount of water in the soil is nonlinear. The amount of water in the soil reveals two distinct breaks, namely the air entry value and the residual point. These two breaks subdivide the unsaturated zone into three subzones. I would like us to visualize an elliptical world of soil mechanics with a phreatic line through the middle of the ellipse. One half of my world is above the phreatic line and one half is below the phreatic line. That sounds fair to me. I'm only asking for one half the world. Most of the built infrastructure in the world is founded on soils located above the water table in the unsaturated soil zone. The saturated so soil zone has historically been analyzed as a single soil unit. However, the unsaturated soil zone needs to be visualized as having three subzones. First, there is the capillary fringe zone just above the water table. It has a degree of saturation, a poroching full saturation. It is an extension of the saturated soil zone. It, is, it has an upper boundary defined by the air entry value. The soil voids in the capillary fringe zone are essentially filled with water while the air phase is discontinuous. The next zone above the capillary fringe zone is referred to as the two phase zone. Here the water phase is continuous and as well the air phase is continuous. This is normally the zone being referred to when the behavior of an unsaturated soil is studied. And if the soil, unsaturated soil, soil zone is sufficiently deep, then there will be a third zone near the ground surface referred to as the dry zone. 
and it has the air phase that is being continuous, while the water phase becomes discontinuous. The division between the two-phase zone and the dry zone is referred to as the residual point. There is a new boundary condition that must be quantified when addressing issues related to unsaturated soil mechanics. We live in a world where moisture at the ground surface is either moving upward from the soil surface in the form of water vapor, or else it is moving downward as rain. Historically, the saturated soil, in saturated soil mechanics, only head boundary conditions and zero flux boundary conditions were used in analyses and analyzing geotechnical engineering problems. However, the quantification of ground surface moisture fluxes becomes an important quantity when dealing with unsaturated soils problems. The development of an applied science framework for saturated-unsaturated soil mechanics must start with the basic stress state variable being defined. The stress state variable for a saturated soil is effective stress, while the stress state variables for an unsaturated soil are two. They are the net normal stress and the soil suction stress. One of the ways to describe the difference between saturated soil behavior and unsaturated soil behavior is through the use of the logic that a change in the total stress components and a change in the pore water pressure component produce different results when analyzing unsaturated soil behavior. Consequently, the stress components must be considered as acting in an independent manner. The stress state variables for an unsaturated soil can be expressed as two independent stress tensors. The stress components take the form of tensors because we live in a three-dimensional world with orthogonal stress components in the x, y, and z direction. These two tensors for an unsaturated soil constitute the basic building blocks for an applied science. The stress state description for both the saturated and an unsaturated soil can also be visualized as surface tractions on a cube representing the stress state at a point in a continuum. The continuum mechanics description of the stress state variables is fundamental to the formulation of an applied science within the context of continuum mechanics. Once the stress state variables are agreed upon, it is then possible to propose appropriate constitutive relations for various physical processes. By way of review, constitutive relations can be defined as empirical relations, semi-empirical relations, or theoretical e equations that take a form, yeah, take a form of an equation, and they will always link state variables. Historically, constitutive relations in soil mechanics have mainly focused on understanding seepage or flow of water through a soil, shear strength of a soil, or volume change and distortion of a soil. It should be noted that constitutive relations always contain material properties. A variety of constitutive relations might be proposed to describe any physical process. However, then the constitutive relationship needs to be verified through research studies. Let us consider the flow of water through a porous medium. Since the inception of saturated soil mechanics, Darcy's law has been the empirical flow law used to describe the movement of water through the soil. Darcy's law states, that the velocity of water flow through a soil is proportional to the hydraulic head gradient. The hydraulic head is defined as the sum of the elevation head and the pore water pressure head. Darcy's law can be experimentally, has been experimentally proven to also apply as a constitutive flow law for unsaturated soils. However, 
there is a difference in that the coefficient of perf permeability is no longer a constant. Rather, the coefficient of permeability has been shown to be predominantly a function of the degree of saturation and can be estimated from the degree of saturation soil water characteristic curve. Let us also consider this constitutive relation for the shear strength of an unsaturated soil. First, the bottom portion of the elliptical world shown has the classic more coulomb shear strength um, equation. This is used for saturated soil. The shear strength parameters are effective cohesion and the effective angle of internal friction. The shear strength equation for an unsaturated soil requires that an extension be made to the more coulomb equation in order to accommodate the second independent stress state variable, namely soil suction. And when the additional stress state variable is added, there must also be accompanied, it must be accompanied by a soil property. Two forms for the modified unsaturated soil shear strength equation are shown in the upper portion of the elliptical world of soil mechanics. The first equation assumes that the soil property associated with soil suction is designated as a constant. The second form is more flexible and shows that the more coulomb equation assumes that the soil property associated with soil suction is a function of the degree of saturation soil water characteristic curve. The basic volume change constitutive relation for a saturated soil is shown in the bottom of the elliptical world of soil mechanics. The constitutive equation shows that the soil property related, relating a change in void ratio to a change in effective stress is the coefficient of compressibility or A sub V. Once again, for, an unsaturated, for the unsaturated soil portion, there is a second independent stress state variable that must likewise have an added additional independent soil property. Understanding the volume change changes that can occur in an unsaturated soil is quite complex and is well beyond the scope of this brief lecture. Suffice it to say that the methodology of extending constitutive relations from a saturated soil to embrace multiple stress state variables remains as a consistent pattern. The remainder of this lecture will be devoted to the laboratory measurement of unsaturated soil properties and the functions that we will obtain, the soil water characteristic curve, and we will also need the shrinkage curve. There are two relatively easy unsaturated soil properties and tests that can be performed in a laboratory. These are important to the geotechnical engineer. The first one is, the gravimetric water content versus soil suction relationship, designated as the gravimetric water content, SWCC. And the second is the shrinkage curved test, designated as SC. Soil specimens used for the soil water characteristic curve can be placed onto a pressure plate apparatus with applied, various applied suctions. The specimens are typically about seven centimeters in diameter and about three centimeters in thickness. The soil specimens might be from an undisturbed sample, it might be from a compacted sample, or it might be from a remolded soil sample. A smaller soil specimen should also be prepared to perform a shrinkage curve test. The specimen is commonly about three centimeters in diameter and is about one centimeter in height. The soil water characteristic curve specimen and the shrinkage curve specimen are initially allowed to absorb water until the matrix suction is zero. Clute in 1965 from the soil physics discipline provided a summary of the complex nature, nature of the soil water characteristic curves. The soil water characteristics 
curves were plotted as the amount of water versus soil su suction. He suggested that the soil water characteristic curve actually consisted of a family of curves with, first of all, an initial drying curve, secondly, a main drying curve, and thirdly, a main wetting curve. The soil water characteristic curves were recognized as being complex in nature by our colleagues in soil physics. But it was also suggested that primary attention should be given to the quantification of the main drying SWCC and that it should be used for the estimation of unsaturated soil property functions. A manufacturing company in Tempe, Arizona, GCTS, developed the pressure plate cell that was uniquely designed for application in geotechnical engineering. The apparatus has a number of features of special interest in, for geotechnical engineering applications. First of all, a vertical load can be applied to the specimen it, to help simulate in situ stress conditions. Or maybe it's just to simply ensure that we have a close contact between the soil specimen and the ceramic disc at all times. Secondly, vertical displacements can be measured under K0 loading conditions. Thirdly, the volume of diffused air can be independently measured and matrix suctions up to 1500 kilopascals can be applied. It should be noted that similar apparatuses have been developed in other parts of the world as well. Now let us consider the steps that need to be followed for the interpretation of the drying soil water characteristic curve. The final objective is to estimate the desired unsaturated soil property functions. An arbitrary division is shown on the soil water characteristic curve at a suction of 1500 kilopascals. Below this value, matrix suction data is plotted versus gravimetric water content. This data is obtained from the pressure plate apparatus. Total suction versus gravimetric water content data are plotted for total suctions greater than 1500 kilopascals. The two data sets constitute a basic thumbprint for the drying behavior of a soil. The intent is to find an, now a, a, an appropriate equation that can be used to best fit the data over the entire suction range. Most soils show a typical S-shaped sigmoidal behavior on a semi-log plot. There are numerous equations that have been proposed for the soil water characteristic curve. I am showing the Fred Lenzing 1994 empirical sigmoidal equation, which has three fitting variables. One indicating the inflection point which on the diagram shown is 75.4 kilopascals. Another is the rate of desaturation. The variable for it is 1.63. It is really the slope at the inflection point. And a third variable is for fitting data near the residual conditions. Residual conditions in this case are near 1,000 kilopascals. The degree of saturation soil water characteristic curve can be obtained by dividing the gravimetric soil water characteristic curve by the shrinkage curve equation. It should be noted that the gravimetric water content soil water characteristic curve can be used without the need of the shrinkage curve data in cases where there is no volume change in the soil as soil suction is increased. Let me simply illustrate the estimation of the permeability function from the soil water characteristic curve. A variety of analytical procedures have been proposed for the calculation of the permeability function. There are several important points that apply to all proposed estimation procedures for the permeability function. First, a dimensionless permeability function can be calculated, which can then be translated vertically such that the permeability function will start 
at any saturated coefficient of permeability. Secondly, if volume changes are small as soil suction increases, the permeability function remains constant up to the air entry value. Thirdly, we observe that the remainder of the permeability function past the air entry value decreases as a near straight line on a log-log plot. Fourthly, the various estimation procedures to obtain the permeability function are essentially integration procedures that take place along the soil water characteristic curve. Stated in another, another way, the various procedures for the permeability function <clears throat> really constitute different integration procedures along the soil water characteristic curve. I would like us to ask the following question at this point. Why do we need the various unsaturated soil property functions for a soil? Let us consider the partial differential equation that can be used to describe the transient flow of water through either a saturated soil or an unsaturated soil. It is the partial differential equation shown at the bottom of the slide. There are two soil property functions required in order to solve this equation, namely the per permeability function and the water storage function. The primary difference between saturated water seepage and unsaturated water seepage lies in the fact that the two material properties related to water flow take on the form of nonlinear functions of soil suction. And this creates a nonlinearity in the partial differential equation, which needs to be solved using an iterative procedure. Let me sum up my presentation by repeating what I feel are a few of the points that are important for undergraduate geotechnical engineers to understand. First, unsaturated soil property functions can be estimated from a combination of the gravimetric water content, SWCC, and a shrinkage curve lab data results. These estimation procedures are adequate for most geotechnical engineering applications. Next, the permeability function for an unsaturated soil can be calculated using an integration procedure along the degree of saturation soil water characteristic curve. The water storage function for an unsaturated soil can be calculated using a differentiation process along the soil water characteristic curve. So we either integrate or we differentiate to get the unsaturated soil property functions. But it is clear that the soil water characteristic curve plays a very important role in getting unsaturated soil mechanics into engineering practice. I have tried in the last half hour to give you the starting point for teaching undergraduate unsaturated soil mechanics. The onus is on each of us to prove that unsaturated soil mechanics concepts can be taught at the undergraduate level. I thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Forte. Very good presentation. It was clear, short. I like it very much. And now we are going to present the text speaker. It's Professor Bernardo Caicedo. É, Bernardo is a professor in the Department of Civil Engineer at the University of Bogotá, Colombia. I have been there and I recommend you visit Bernardo. He received his PhD degree in civil engineering from the Ecole Centrale de Paris, France. His research interests include unsaturated soil mechanics, soil dynamics, the behavior of soft rocks, physical model in the centrifuge, and the behavior of road materials. Bernardo is currently the vice chair of the Technical Committee on Unsaturated Soil of the International Society for Soil Mechanics and Geotechnical Engineering. 
He's a member of the Technical Committee in Transportation Geotechnics of the International Society. He's the author of two books about geotechnics of roads, and he wrote more than 100 scientific papers. He has been awarded with the Geotech Research Medal of the Institute of Civil Engineer of UK. Thank you, Bernard, for being here. Thank you very much, Katia, for this very kind presentation and uh, for uh, this invitation to deliver uh, the speech. Uh, ah, sorry. Uh, so, share. Okay, can you see my slide? Yes, that's okay. okay. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. So, I would like to focus this uh, uh, this presentation in the possibilities of uh, centrifuge modeling for teaching unsaturated soil mechanics at the undergraduate level. But unfortunately, for the moment we uh, don't do that. So I will show you all the possibilities that this centrifuge modeling offer to uh, teach uh, unsaturated soil mechanics at the undergrad level. First, uh, it is clear that nowadays centrifuge modeling is widely used to study the performance of uh, uh, different types of geotechnical works, but mainly involving saturated clays or dry sands. Uh, the use of centrifuge modeling in problems involving unsaturated soils is, 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 is scarce, is more limited. This limitation is probably related to the complexities of unsaturated soil that certainly increases uh, in, in, in centrifuge modeling. But in fact, geocentrifuge may be used in two different ways. The first way we can uh, call that as centrifuge testing. In this case, we use uh, the centrifuge as a tool to increase the, gra the gravity, uh, and then increase certain parameters, for example, the flow velocity. Uh, nowadays, this technique is, is, is used to, to measure the water retention curve, for example, or the unsaturated water permeability. But it is centrifuge testing. And the second possibility is uh, to uh, perform centrifuge modeling. And centrifuge modeling is, is very interesting because it permits to extrapolate the results of small scale models to a full scale prototype and is strongly linked to boundary value problems. So I will uh, focus uh, this presentation in uh, the use of centrifuge modeling it means boundary value problems, but at the undergrad level. In, in Los Angeles, we have two uh, centrifuges, uh, a medium one, you can see uh, this one in, in, in this image. It is a 40 G ton beam centrifuge. And 40 G ton means that you can have models of, for example, 400 kilograms and spin up up to uh, 100 G. And we have another one, is, is a small one, uh, 0 0.8 G ton, and it is a mini beam uh, centrifuge. The medium one, we use uh, this machine for mainly for research, but the small one is used mainly for teaching and mainly for teaching at the undergrad level. 
This is a, a, a video of the medium one uh, spinning uh, at a slow velocity. And uh, this is the, the, the mini beam centrifuge we, uh, that we use for, for teaching at undergrad level. So the radius is uh, 56 centimeters, and we can have models of uh, four kilograms, and we can uh, accelerate those models up to 200 G. We have the, so the, the, the baskets and the strong box to put models. And uh, also we can control the, the, the position of the, of the phreatic level. Very important, uh, as uh, we, when we use small models, it is very difficult to put uh, a lot of sensors because in this case, we will, you will have a mixture of soil and sensors. Uh, so it's better to analyze the results only uh, by image analysis. For this uh, case, we, we, we have a, a Always in all tests, we have a camera for that purpose. And also a data acquisition systems for uh, a limited number of sensors we use. But let me talk about, about uh, our courses in Los Andes Engineering, in, uh, in uh, geotechnical engineering, but at the undergraduate level. It is similar than, uh, maybe all the universities around the world. In the theoretical part, we have uh, two courses. One, we call that uh, geotechnic, geotechnics fundamentals. It's similar than soil mechanics. And the second one, we call this course geotechnical structures, but it is similar to uh, courses uh, related to foundation in general. And from the point of view of the experimental work, in the uh, soil mechanic course, as it is usual, we do a lot of element tests. But in contrast to uh, teach geotechnical structures uh, from the experimental point, point of view, we use uh, centrifuge modeling. And the topics we cover in this second course are, are very broad. In situ tests, slope stability, retaining walls, shallow foundations, piles, and all that at the undergraduate level. So the focus of this presentation will be the fir first, what we do in uh, undergraduate teaching using centrifuge. Second, what we do in research of unsaturated soils using centrifuge. And finally, some ideas that uh, how uh, can be used uh, as centrifuge to teach unsaturated soils at the undergraduate level. So first, what we do in undergraduate teaching using centrifuge. Uh, as I told you, we have several topics, uh, but for all those topics, the first step is to prepare soils. We focus uh, mainly on clays. Uh, so so we, the, the first step is to prepare soils, clays, at different consolidation stresses but in the saturated state. For this purpose, we have a lot of boxes uh, for the centrifuge and also uh, several frames, uh, pneumatic frames for consolidation. And those uh, frames are, are automatic. Uh, you put the, the level of stresses you need and uh, the, the pressure increases following the, the Asaoka method for consolidation. And then we perform uh, tests, boundary value tests. 
And the first uh, set of tests uh, on those models that were consolidated at different uh, vertical stress are in situ tests. For example, we perform van tests uh, in the left of uh, your screen and a dynamic penetration test uh, in the right. Uh, Yes, I continue. And also a CPT, a mini CPT, of course. So you can uh, move uh, the, the, the small cone and you measure mainly the tip, mainly the tip, the tip strength. And afterwards, we compare the different results of the soils that were consolidated at different consolidation stress. Well, afterwards, some uh, examples of boundary uh, value uh, problems. For example, slope stability. Uh, you can see here a test on slope stability. And then the students uh, analyze the displacement vectors using based on image analysis. In fact. So we teach the the how to apply the shear strength to uh, the slope stability uh, analysis. Afterwards, retaining walls, and in this case, we prefer to use sand because. Uh, we prefer to uh, analyze those, this problem uh, in, in, in effective stress, in fact. So we use dry sand. Then uh, bearing capacity. This is an example of one test of, of bearing capacity. It is not uh, for the uh, uh, undergrad students. It was a research about the effect of the soil variability on the bearing capacity. But in fact, the test that the undergrad students perform is the same. The, the only difference is that for those students, the soil is homogeneous. So you can see in the right, the, the beautiful shear bands. And also uh, they analyze the, the, the displacement vectors using image analysis. Now, let me move to uh, what we do in research in unsaturated soils using centrifuge. Some examples because we, we do a lot of, a lot of things. Uh, one, uh, one study, one very interesting study was performed with my uh, colleague uh, Luke Torel from the University, Université Gustave Eiffel in France. And uh, the, the question here was, which is the effect of uh, the gigantic cracks for example, in, in the photo, you, you can see the gigantic cracks in, uh, in the soil deposit of Bogota. The effect of those cracks on the bearing capacity uh, of shallow foundations. So the problem is uh, we have a, a very deep cracks and uh, the, those cracks form columns of soils. And sometimes those columns collapse due to the self weight of the columns or due to uh, an external load. And uh, you have uh, uh, roots in, 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 the, in the cracks and also some slip surface on the cracks. So we, we, we imagined at those, uh, in, in those studies, uh, some model of 
uh, cracked soil. In fact, it is it is difficult to prepare uh, an unsaturated soil mainly when when the model is big because it takes a lot of time to 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 dry uh, the soil. So one option is to use a compacted soil. In this case, we have at the top of the model an over-consolidated uh, soil, which is compacted at very high stresses, and on the bottom, a normally consolidated soil. And then we apply uh, different uh, loads in different points when the uh, cracks uh, have a different, different depth. You can see here, it is the, 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 the centrifuge at the, uh, uh, the University Gustave Eiffel in Nantes, France. The bearing capacity tests, and then the CPT tests. So it was so, um, uh, those are the results of the CPT test, the tip resistance, uh, uh, as a function of depth. And very, very interesting and very surprising. Uh, well, you, you have first, with the first test, you, you don't have cracks. And uh, you can see first the, 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 tip, the high tip resistance because it is the over consolidated soil. And then at the bottom, low uh, tip resistance, the normally consolidated soil. But as you have, mm, deeper cracks, the soil desiccates along the, crack, the cracks and the tip resistance increases a lot. So you can, you can see as, as, the, as the cracks penetrates, uh, the, the, the soil, the top soil uh, dries more and more. And then when the cracks connect with the normally consolidated soil, which is saturated, uh, it is amazing, but the tip resistance decreases uh, again. And when you have a covered surface, even if you have cracks, uh, you don't have an increase in the tip resistance. Well, this is a, an example of the, of the problem we study in, in centrifuge. Another problem is the soil atmosphere interaction. And for this purpose, we have a, um, a, a climatic chamber. And this climatic, climatic chamber uh, is able, you, you can control the, the relative humidity, temperature, wind velocity, sun radiation, etc. So you have the soil, all that is in a, a, an adiabatic strong box. And at the top, you have the climatic actuator. And the, the, the results on the right, you can see how temperature and suction moves when you apply different uh, drying uh, and wetting cycles. Other uh, type of problems we, we uh, studied in the centrifuge is uh, rain-induced landslides. Uh, it is funny, but due to the time, is, uh, I will not present it uh, today. But uh, when you uh, try to apply rain in a in centrifuge, the the, the little uh, uh, droplets of water are affected by the Coriolis acceleration. So sometimes you have a uh, raining that goes upwards. But it, 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 uh, we have a software that analyze the direction of the droplets when you try to reproduce rain. But also what is interesting, we have a, um, an apparatus that can apply different level of precipitation at different uh, elapsed times. So, what you, you apply the, 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 the rain you, you, you desire, and then you have uh, some cumulated amount of water in the rain. 
Also, you can measure the uh, displacements of the slopes. And also, uh, this figure shows you the displacement uh, of a particular point in the slope um, as a function of the accumulated rain uh, due to the, well, the, the, the amount of water. Also, uh, uh, to finish, uh, we uh, we have another climatic chamber to study to study cracks on soils, the, the, the cracking process when we dry an, an unsaturated soil. Uh, you can see here the results obtained with this uh, climatic chamber. In this case, we have uh, uh, contraction mainly only. And in this case, we have contraction, some contraction, and some cracking. And finally, finally, some idea, ideas about teaching unsaturated soils at undergraduate level. And as we uh, are interested in, in centrifuge modeling, so uh, is uh, to, to simulate boundary value problems. But the first point is, the first question, and this is an, import, is an important question, is how to prepare the soils. You can compact soils. It is certainly an unsaturated soil, but it is different than uh, a natural unsaturated soil. Another, another way, and we have uh, this small uh, climatic chamber, is to prepare a saturated soil and then dry it from the, from the top uh, applying uh, or simulating the, the evaporation and then we can uh, we can uh, build uh, any kind of, of geotechnical work over this desiccated soil but finally some remarks certainly it is possible and interesting to include examples of the effect of unsaturated soils in teaching and uh, the effect basically in boundary value problems. But we have still some questions. And, and, and the, first, uh, well, the first question, of course, was how to prepare the soil, but also which kind of problem uh, show the effect of suction on the performance of, of the geotechnical structure. Uh, probably the problems of, of slope stability could be a, a good example to show the effect of, of suction uh, on and the unsaturated uh, behavior of, of the soil. And of course, as I told you, uh, the second question, how to prepare the soil. Compaction is an easy way, certainly. But the soil differs from uh, a natural unsaturated soil. Or the other, pos the other possibility is uh, to apply, apply desiccation of a soil that starts in uh, a saturated state. So final finally, we have uh, ideas. Ideas to, to show uh, in the undergrad level, the effect of unsaturated uh, soil mechanics. And probably at this level, uh, some qualitative analysis is possible. But, but, but uh, theoretical analysis, I think it requires more, no, more knowledge. But certainly, uh, uh, qualitative analysis is enough for uh, undergrad level. That's all. Thank you very much for your attention. And at the end, I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Bernardo. Uh, it's very, it was a very interesting uh, presentation. And I'm sure uh, that we can take advantage of the centrifuge to teach and the students in a, in a way that they uh, become much more engaged. So it's uh, certainly yes. a, a very, interesting approach if we have the means <laughs> of yes. course yes uh, 
Yeah. So uh, before I introduce our last speaker, uh, I would like to um, tell the audience that they can uh, send questions. Uh, so you can write your questions in a, a chat box. And it, 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 you can write questions in Portuguese. I will translate them if you if you prefer to write in Portuguese, okay? Uh, I have to say that because, of course, we have a lot of Brazilians watching this now. Um, so our uh, next last speaker is uh, Professor John McCartney. Uh, he is a professor in the Department of Structural Engineering at the University of California, San Diego. His research interests include saturated soil mechanics, geosynthetics, engineering, and energy geotechnics. He is currently a past president of the North American chapter of the International Geosynthetics Society. He is an editor of Computers, Computers and Geotechnics and the Journal of Geotechnical and Geoenvironmental Engineering, and is an associate editor of the Canadian Geotechnical Journal. He received his BSc and MSc degrees in civil engineering from the University of Colorado Boulder in 2002, and a PhD degree in civil engineering from the University of Texas at Austin in 2007. Uh, John is right now in another place in this planet. It's very late right now where he is speaking from, and uh, we really appreciate his willingness to participate and welcome him. Thank you, John. Thank you, Jocelyn. Okay, so yeah, thank you, Jocelyn and, and Katya for inviting me here. I'm, I'm in Croatia right now. I flew from San Diego, uh, I suppose yesterday. Uh, we arrived this afternoon and uh, yeah, it's midnight right now, but I'm very happy to talk about uh, unsaturated soils anytime, anyplace. So um, I think we can share the screen. Okay, so I'm gonna go over to my presentation now. Um, so I, I wanted to make a couple of, of points in my presentation today. Um, one, that unsaturated soils, um, one way to try to um, teach these undergraduate students who are you know, learning about soils in general for the very first time is to treat um, unsaturated soils as the general case for soils and that saturated and dry conditions are actually special cases of an unsaturated soil. So that's one thing that I, I try to teach in my class. And second, that there needs to always be some linkage between water flow and the mechanical response of soils. So that's why I wrote in my title, um, building an understanding of the impacts of transient water flow processes on the mechanical behavior of unsaturated soils. So those are two things that I try to capture in my undergraduate class. Um, I'm going to actually show you some uh, slides that I use, um, that I, I, I work on during my um, teaching of this undergraduate class, SE 181, which is the Introduction to Geotechnical Engineering. Um, we have a, a quarter system at UCSD, so each course is 10 weeks long, so we actually have a very short period of time to cover um, the materials that we, we need to understand in geotechnical engineering. Um, we have three courses, so SE 181 is the first geotechnical course, uh, 182 is a course on foundation engineering, and 184 is a course on uh, soil improvement and uh, applications in geotechnical engineering. So 181 is really the best place for us to introduce um, basic soil properties and uh, linkages between water flow and mechanical response. Um, so this is the place where I try to introduce unsaturated soil concepts. So a few different ways that I talk about unsaturated soils in the course are first talking about phase relationships. Um, I talk about um, capillarity and hydraulic properties, uh, mainly the hydraulic connectivity and soil water retention curve. Um, I actually derive the full governing equation for um, water flow and deformation in soils and then uh, reduce that to different special cases in the course, one of them being Richard's equation, which is the governing equation for water flow in unsaturated soils. And then at the end, I um, talk about effective stress and how that can be defined in saturated, dry, and unsaturated soils, 
and how that can be linked with things like the shear strength and stiffness of soils. Um, so there's different uh, ways that I've tried to integrate unsaturated soils concepts into my uh, courses. First, as I mentioned, um, well, I, I try to first highlight ways that unsaturated soils are actually encountered in nature. Um, whenever we build a fill type structure, we're actually hoping that it's going to remain unsaturated so we can take advantage of the um, both the engineered characteristics of the, the soil itself, the density, um, but also the fact that the unsaturated soil is going to have a higher shear strength than if the soil were saturated. Um, but we also can encounter unsaturated soils in natural conditions above the water table. Um, I also try to, as I mentioned, to always present soils as a general um, in a general case as a three-phase media, um, in which case it's very important to learn your phase relationships and compaction uh, theories to understand that. Um, I always think that flow processes and the hydraulic properties that are governing the flow processes are critical, and these need to be combined together with our state of stress um, to quantify the, the stress state in unsaturated soils. Um, so here are the, the main topics that I try to cover in 13 weeks, or sorry, in 10 weeks, uh, 13 main topics um, in my undergraduate soil class. And the way that I structured my presentation today was to go through each of these topics, um, mainly the ones that are in italics, and show some examples of slides that I give to the students. Um, when I show these in this presentation today, I'm not going to spend a lot of time to, to go through the, the different basics as I do in the course, but I just wanted to give you a flavor of you know, what sort of materials I'm talking about at different stages in the class to introduce and uh, talk about soils in general and unsaturated soils in particular. So in the very first lecture, I'm giving the students an introduction to geotechnical engineering. Um, the very first slide that I show in the class is to convince students that soil is a mixture of solids, water, and air, or other gases, and that we can have these three different cases, uh, dry, saturated, or in general, unsaturated soils. So from the very start of the class, I try to, to talk about unsaturated soils and how um, you know, the dry and saturated conditions are actually specific cases of unsaturated soils. Um, I talk about um, what geotechnical engineers do, what type of problems we solve. Um, but one important thing I wanted to mention on this slide was that we are looking at this linkage between water flow, deformation, and shear strengths, shear strength in order to um, link our uh, soil mechanics to actual uh, geotechnical engineering designs. Um, I tried to tell the students the, the wide range of different uh, subfields within geotechnical engineering where um, you're not only going to uh, encounter different challenges, but you're also going to encounter unsaturated soils. So I think in, in each of these different applications shown on the, this slide here, we're going to encounter some sort of unsaturated soil effect, either because the soil is a fill material or because of the natural flow processes happening. Um, so moving on to engineering geology, I, I, in this section, I talk a lot about you know, how soils are formed and the mineralogy and things like that. Um, so really, I don't talk a lot about unsaturated soil conditions, but I do talk about uh, two important conditions of, for the sedimented soils, uh, the residual soils and transported soils. And um, I kind of emphasize there that the structure of the soil is very important in uh, controlling the behavior and that the soil is filled with either liquid or gas based on the historic uh, things that happened in geology that are resulting in the soil layer that we have now. Um, so the mass volume relationships in this class, I think this is always one of the most fundamental topics in any introductory soil mechanics course. And this is really a good place to talk a lot about um, how unsaturated soils are different than saturated soils. Some students like when they go into this topic, they're just looking for the formulas. Um, you know, what is the relationship between this and that? But it's actually a good opportunity to talk about unsaturated soils and how you're going you know, where you're going to be using 
these mass volume relationships and unsaturated soils problems. So in particular, earthquake calculations or compaction analyses. Um, I always like to use the phase diagram when I'm de deriving these um, uh, mass volume relationships. And I like this because I don't like students to memorize the equations. I like them to understand why we're, we're doing this phase diagram and how we need to link the volumes of the different constituents with their masses or weights. Um, and then we go through the different assumptions that we need to make when we're trying to derive this. Um, the unit weight is very important. And we know that as water um, is added to the soil or removed, it's going to have a major effect on the weight of the soil. Uh, usually, we're not going to be having changes in the weight of the solids within soil. But um, as water flow happens, it's going to change the degree of saturation. And that's going to change the weight of the soil. So we start immediately talking about, um, about uh, unsaturated soils and how the, the weights of unsaturated soils changes as the transient water flow happens. Now, let me look at the different linkages and how we can apply the phase diagram to link the different variables. Uh, we talk a lot about the uh, degree of saturation and the porosity void ratio and volumetric air and water contents. And use these different concepts to classify the soil into either saturated dry or, or general unsaturated conditions. Um, so the, the first real uh, place where the students are going to look at um, real uh, uh, conditions in the field are, is compaction. Um, so up until that point, they're mainly talking about uh, the, you know, the words that we use to describe soils and the basic properties, but they haven't started to see anything that is constructed in the field. So compaction is the first case. Um, I tried to emphasize the, the difference between fill type structures, where we're going to be having unsaturated materials, and we want the soil to remain unsaturated throughout its lifetime. And then also the cut type structures, where the groundwater table is going to con control the degree of saturation. And I apologize if my handwriting is, is bad on any of these slides. Uh, the students have to suffer through uh, figuring out what these are. But uh, when I write the, in, in my lectures, I'd like to have some pictures like this, and I can write notes. And then at the end of the course, I can save it as a, a PDF, and then the students can come back and uh, check everything that I've written. Um, so then we introduce the, the compaction curve how the degree of saturation is an important limit on the compaction of soils, um, how the soil structure is going to change depending on our compaction conditions, how the degree of saturation is going to follow the shape of our um, uh, zero air voids line, and also how the compaction water content that we're going to use is going to change the properties that we're going to get at the end of the compaction process. And we can use all of these different uh, changes in soil properties, um, for example, from this uh, paper, paper by Mitchell, to define uh, compaction specifications that we can use in practice. Um, so going on to permeability, there's now uh, two sections where we focus a lot on the properties of soils and on the, uh, the flow. So we talk about Bernoulli's equation. Um, this is all standard for most saturated soil mechanics. But I always like to talk about this no flow condition. And we talk about how uh, negative water pressures can be encountered if we go above the water table. And um, we have these negative water pressures, but it doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be water there. Uh, we need to then later introduce the concept of the soil water retention curve to see how much water is going to be present for a given negative water pressure. Um, I also like to talk about uh, uh, the kozani karman equation so that I can uh, start looking at what are the variables governing the uh, hydraulic connectivity of the soil or the, the permeability, and to show that the hydraulic connectivity is a function of both water properties as well as the uh, porous media properties. Um, going on to seepage, this is where I start to derive the general governing equation uh, for water flow and deformation of soils. And then I 
uh, break this down to look at different uh, specific problems. So look at continuity um, and then use this mass of fluid being stored in a given volume of soil to look at changes of degree of saturation, porosity, or fluid density. And for unsaturated soils, these first two can be very important. If you're looking at gas flow, the third one could be important. Um, and all three of those are very important for unsaturated soils. Um, so we can then simplify this equation down um, going through the mathematics and come up with a big, large governing equation here. And if we're looking at seepage, then all of our transient terms go to zero and we end up with a Laplace equation. But we also come back to this equation later and look at the cases where there is transient water flow. So we come back to light. This is a few slides later in that same lecture where we've talked about seepage already and how to solve that using flow nets and other things. And we start talking about unsaturated soils. So we want to look at both uh, unconstrained flow conditions, like if we have water flow through a dam, as well as infiltration and evaporation from an unsaturated soil layer. Um, then we start talking about what are the differences in uh, these different properties of saturated and unsaturated soils and how the effective stress could change. We haven't really talked about effective stress yet, but we start to introduce those here. Um, we talk about how hydraulic head can be a little bit different in unsaturated soils because we have two phases. And we go back to our, our continuity equation, uh, combine that with Darcy's law, and use that to derive Richard's equation. So we've now gone back to our governing equation and uh, come up with a, a new transient equation. And we use this equation to look at the different properties that are going to be important, our soil water retention curve and our hydraulic connectivity function. Um, so then when we try to introduce those properties, we need to look at capillarity. So the uh, Young-Laplace equation is uh, one of the first ways to talk about this, where we can link the energy state in the soil with the radius of a, a pore and use that as the transition point to start talking about the uh, soil water retention curve. I always like to try to show that the grain size distribution is related to the pore size distribution, which is then related to the shape of our soil water retention curve. And then I try to show data from the literature um, that, that we actually have little points that we need to somehow capture with a model. And we can use models like those shown on this slide to fit lines to that set of data. And there's different features of the different models um, that are going to be adv advantageous for uh, numerical simulations or, or other cases. And then again, we talk about hydraulic connectivity function and how that's going to be related to our soil water retention curve and how even a, a material like sand can have a high hydraulic connectivity when saturated, but a lower hydraulic connectivity than clay when it becomes unsaturated. And then here I start to go back and combine the hydrostatic uh, water pressure profile that we derived when we were looking at, at uh, water flow together with the soil water retention curve and then the unit weight with the uh, phase relationships. So to try to integrate all the concepts that we had talked about before. Um, and then finally, going into the state of stress in the soils, we need to talk about the, the stresses that are going to be stress, stresses and pressures encountered in the uh, different fluids as well as the normal stresses in the soil. And then we talk about how even in saturated and dry soils, we need to have some uh, different equations to capture the, the average effective stress state. And there's always some assumptions that go into those that we need to, to take in order to find the uh, effective stress state that we uh, know from Terzaghi's equation. Um, so we look at both the area effects as well as effective stress related to stiffness. Um, so we use Skempton's paper in the course. Um, and then we bring that along to talk about Bishop's equation um, and talk about how effective stress is going to vary with degree of saturation. And um, we talk about how the salt water retention curve can be linked with the effective stress through this uh, value of chi, the effective stress parameter in Bishop's equation. Um, and you can 
look at that relationship between chi multiplied by the suction as our suction stress and show how that's going to change for different uh, soils. Finally, we uh, integrate the concept of our suction stress together with the shear strength of soils. So after talking about all of the basics of the Mohr circle and everything like that, we show some examples on how unsaturated conditions can lead to an apparent tensile strength or apparent cohesion, and how we can unify the behavior of the unsaturated soils together with saturated or dry soils using uh, the effective stress concept. And how a, a set of data like this um, presented in total stress, when we plot it in terms of effective stress, we can unify all of the data points into a single relationship. So some final comments. Um, I tried to emphasize that unsaturated soil concepts are inherently part of um, geotechnical engineering in general, and we just need to pull these out and highlight them rather than making uh, unsaturated soils a special course. I do teach a, a graduate course on unsaturated soil mechanics where we go into a lot more detail, but I think that we can try to emphasize the unsaturated soil aspects in our current curriculum. Um, I try to pre present the formulations for unsaturated soils as a general case before simplifying them down to saturated or dry conditions. Uh, and similarly for presenting the governing equations, um, try to come up with one big equation that can be simplified to look at different problems and then use that to emphasize the importance of linking transient flow to the mechanical response of soils. And um, I think that we can sometimes even use unsaturated soils concepts to better understand uh, conventional geotechnical problems, like what are the variables affecting hydraulic connectivity, effective stress, etc. So with that, um, I'd like to finish the presentation. I think we can move to the next stage. Oh, I think Katya, you're on mute. Seu microfone está fechado. Before I present, just the uh, previous slide for the discuss, but before I have to say something to you, John, I like very much your lecture. And actually, you ask me a difficult question when I, we, you ask me what I want to, to present, because John told me, do you want me to present the way that I present my classes or the way that that I think that I should present my question, my lectures. I said, I don't know because, do you know, but now I can answer you. I think that that's the way that we should do. That's the way that we should present the class for the undergraduate level. Because actually it's the, the even the rent writing, I like very much. I remember the, Professor Co classy because he used to go to the blackboard. And I love that. I think that in this way, you bring the subject uh, close to us. I have to prepare some questions for this section, but I couldn't, I, my attention was in your presentation because that's the way that I think that we should do. I like very much. I think that I, I, I have to say you, thank you very much because I know that you travel all day and now you present us and was, I think that this is the way, but I'm going just to show you a slide for start the discussion. Because also the, 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 the sometimes the, 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 the professional, uh, the, we, we diverge about the concepts, even in saturated soils. We don't know everything about saturated soils. Because natural material is complicated. Bernardo told that uh, compact soils is, uh, because for the prepared the sample for the centrifuge test by using the natural material. But natural material is complicated. So, so saturated soil, the particular case, uh, it's complicated. If you want to complicate. But for example, uh, sometimes we don't need to complicate. We don't need a complete soil water characteristic 
just a part of that will make us solve our problem. If you are not solving our problem, it's okay also if you understand the problem, I think. And that's the, 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 the undergrad student need. I, I like very much. I just show you. I think you went on mute again, Katya. Seu microfone, professora, cortou. Professora Katia, seu microfone. Ah, ok. So, please, uh, if you want to write questions, comments about the talk uh, in the chat, please do that, because it's a great opportunity. We have a, a, a very good uh, specialist in unsaturated soil, but they are very good teacher. So it's a, a great opportunity for us to talk to them. So please write the questions and we are going to discuss for the second part of the section and everybody's very welcome to participate and there is no excuse for the language because you can write in Portuguese, you can write in Spanish, in, in French, we can handle that, okay? So I will go to show my, my, my slide. Uh, Rafael, can you see? Can, can you see, Rafael? Yes, see. Okay. So, uh, just what I uh, actually, uh, Gilson helped me with the presentation of this slide. And then we were trying to, to write some talks that we could discuss about the teaching on saturated soil mechanics at the undergraduate level. But actually, we should teach. A, a, and as soil mechanics. I think that the class is soil mechanics, the fundamental, but should also try, we should uh, provide a broader understanding of the soil behavior. And there is no only the two uh, special situations. We not, cannot choose the special situation when we are talking uh, about nature materials. So I think that's nice for us to discuss that. Also, uh, the students like the, the, to be close to the practice. So uh, that's something that also we, we should start to discuss, even for example, for the, uh, the, the, the soil investigation, the, 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 the basic SPT results uh, change with the water table level. So we, could show the student that's not a, a fixed point. So uh, the, 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 the resistance, the penetration resistance depends on the saturation. And that's something that we should consider when we are doing discuss because sometimes we present the, 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 the SPT results, the CPT results, but the students think that that is the, the, the answer for all the, 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 the the situation in that field, it, that's not the help because time is important also in the solution. Also the requirement, uh, I think that now I am going to also write. I, I, I don't have a very good also range to write, but I think that's it's something that uh, we, we need to, to make these things uh, simple. And do these things simple is not easy require not to, a lot of knowledge for, for making these things simple. Also, the, the, the field investigation, the laboratory results, uh, it's something that helps us. It's cost, it's time, but sometimes, for example, I think that the pandemic time teach us, for me, was that something that I learned about the, the, the virtual uh, teaching. I was not used, a, uh, to handle that. And I think that's something that we can share because, for example, some test results, for example, as Bernardo showed us, can be used for, 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 for teaching. And that's something nice the, the, to see how the things change. And uh, one challenge that we wrote, Gilson and I, was the, the education material. So, um, the support of textbook. Professor Fredlin, I like very much his book, but uh, because I remember that the first time that uh, I, I have Professor Fredlin's book was something very nice, Professor, because what I, 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 I could, in that time, I remember that was 
I could find a lot of reference in one book. I think that was very nice. So I thank you for that. And also afterwards, we have some, uh, some nice textbooks. And the didactic material, for example, spreadsheets students are used. So sometimes uh, for us, uh, uh, even the, the, the effective stress, uh, we could present some things, some videos. So now I think that, uh, and the first thing is that if the instructor, they don't know well the subject, or they think that they don't know well the subject, or they don't want to know more about the subject, because sometimes that they think that unsaturated is more resistant. The soil unsaturated is more resistant. So uh, they don't care about that. Uh, and so the, the maybe a, a interaction be between the, 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 the even the, in the International Society the Technical Committee, for example, I think that we can share some uh, uh, education, uh, some slides, some things that can help also the educator include that material in the in, in their class. And also uh, something for sometimes that we know that uh, uh, even in saturated soil also the laboratory uh, it's something that costs. So maybe we could think about a virtual, not virtual laboratory because uh, the laboratory uh, we should uh, we, we need that for soils mechanic, but also we can uh, have a cooperative learning program, for example, about it to um, discuss that. And that's something that I I, I think that something that maybe we could discuss uh, in the, the the next section of the webinar. But I think that Gilson, we do have questions now. From now, we have some questions. Yeah, sure, we do. Uh, Rafael, if you could show all of our speakers, there you go. So we have a few questions here, um, and I, I can share the screen so you can see the questions in the screen. Uh, this is from Lucas. So I think this is, yeah, this is a very general question. It's not necessarily uh, uh, only for Bernardo, Bernardo, but I think that uh, he could say something about that. Yes, certainly it changed a lot because uh, all those tests are based on the sheer strength of the soil. So when you change uh, suction, uh, the shear strength moves, and then the results of the of, of the uh, in situ tests also change a lot. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, before we move to an, uh, another question, I would just like to make a, a quick comment on the, the issues that uh, uh, Katya spoke about. And perhaps something that was not uh, discussed or mentioned here is the fact that um, in the case of teaching a saturated soil mechanics, uh, problem solving uh, is more challenging for undergrad students. Uh, and uh, in my case, I, I try to, but my approach is very similar to Jones uh, in the sense that I, I, I try to to combine everything as the, the subject is, is presented. I, I don't separate unsat uh, saturated soil behavior. It, it goes along. Um, of course, some lectures, they, uh, they require me to give greater attention to that specific subject, but I try to do something similar. But, but then when it comes to uh, evaluating the student's understanding of the subject, then and that often, it often is, comes along with problem solving, that's a big challenge. Um, in my case, for example, what I found to be the ideal approach, for example, for seepage, is um, uh, uh, tests are not adequate. We have to uh, uh, use uh, 
have problems where they solve and they they send their reports so they can it gives them the, an opportunity to to think about the problem so and for us to to offer them more challenging problems and, and in my specific case I, I i like to use a very nice um uh software for steep page analysis called uh flex pd it's a very interesting uh alternative because you teach the physics for the students and the software does the math so that you, they don't use a, a black box, at least in the physics part of the problem. Um, if you want to make any comments, any of you, Professor Fredon or Bernardo or John on, on this specific topic, I think it would be really nice. Just uh, one comment in connection with slope stability. I, uh, I was asked uh, in, actually in Mexico by undergraduate students to give them an example of um, uh, solving a practical problem uh, on, in slope stability. If we don't have complex software that takes into account the unsaturated, can you still teach us something about the concepts? And so uh, by teaching them that cohesion has a effective cohesion and it has a, a, co a capillary cohesion we'll say and so you you can use any conventional slope stability software uh, they can take uh, even some of the f the free packages that are given out by companies and you just vary the cohesion in any pattern they want and just see the effect of it on the slope stability i found that Without any sophisticated software, you can you can get a, a, a lot of concepts across. The slope stability problem is a very interesting one because I think we have really something to contribute there. Uh, it's you can't just go and tell these people that you're going to design for saturated conditions because it's the most serious. That isn't a very good solution for them. In fact, the truth of the matter is that the 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 key to the instability of a slope lies in the unsaturated zone. The ability to model the unsaturated zone and moisture movement from between the ground surface and the water table, the ability to move down, can tell you a lot about when stability, instability would occur. You don't need any sophisticated software to, to do some of these practical problems. So there's a series of problems that can be solved in connection with unsaturated so without getting complex. But I emphasize in, in my talk, I wanted to focus on concepts because we, when we introduce students to strength of materials, we start with the stress state. And, and um, Continuum mechanics has been very good to us for almost a century now. And I, the principles of continuum mechanics form the concepts for an applied science. And that's sort of, I um, got to be careful what I teach at the undergraduate level because you can lose them very fast in equations. But it's not the equations, it's the concepts. If you think right, you will propose good solutions. You don't have to have the best computer program. You have to think right. So our job as university professors is to brainwash the students into thinking right. <laughs> OK, enough. Good point. Menada, did you want to say anything? Yes, yes. I, I don't know how is in, in your universities, but the question I have always when I start my undergrad course is, 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 is the question I have is the following. Most of our, my students will uh, practice civil engineering in fields different than, than soil mechanics and different than geotechnical engineering. But most of them will be affected by, by, by soil mechanics. Probably uh, people that work in, in, in management, in construction, etc. most of the problems uh, in civil engineering are related to geotechnical engineering. 
So the question when I start teaching is, if I know that most of the students will develop their, their career in, in fields different than soil mechanics, how they can remember the, the basic principles. So I think when they saw the, the, the phenomena, uh, probably they, they don't remember the, 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 the procedure to make uh, computations, etc. But they will remember the behavior of the structures. That 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 the, the um, that's my point. Yeah. Did you yeah, definitely. Uh, I I definitely agree agree with uh, Bernardo. Um, I I think that the students you know like the concepts and the framework that we give them in the course, but then really having the feel of how things work, you know, you really do need to go to the lab and touch the soil and build it and see how how it behaves and how you have different types of soil. You can have clay and sand and they're going to be completely different. Um, but we, we start from the same concepts for both of those materials. And uh, I, I really like the undergraduate uh, centrifuge is, is the, the tool in that. And when I was at uh, University of Colorado, we were also very frequently using that in our courses and uh yeah i, mean, I, I don't think it's a, a huge investment to build the, the small centrifuge yeah. like that it's, um, it's much less than a triaxial test yeah. it's some few percent of a triaxial apparatus yeah. in brazil the problem was with the the, the tax because I remember that when I came from Boulder in 90, the end of 9, was $1,000, this small centrifuge. And that was much less than the, 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 the triaxial cell. But the problem was the, the importation tax was very expensive at that time. So I think that now we can manage that. Better. But it's very nice when we see, the students like that, when we see even when we touch the soil, because I remember that's something that interests me, because sometimes uh, the people, even the practice, they forget that the, when the, the compact soils, it's not natural, Bernard, but it's on Saturday state. Yeah. Yeah. So, and also they still, with sometimes, for example, the, the specification is about more optimum moisture quantity. That doesn't mean anything. The saturation, the saturation curves help much more and could help the, the specification. They understand better which the moist, they should compact the soil. But they still, with the optimal water count, sometimes it's not easy to change the things. I think that that's one problem because, uh, John, saturated soil arrive early. So now it's, you know, even in a specific situation, it's, particular situation arrive early so it's kind of now uh, you see it's not easy for show that the 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 it's only a part of the problem and very specific situation that most of the time you don't have that situation but because of that for example uh, even the 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 the, the something the the, the 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 as professor uh, Fred and show with the for example the the degree of saturation lines the, the, the theoretical uh, lines of degree of saturation that there is no computer will do that so easy. And, and sometimes they don't do that. I don't know why. Maybe because uh, we start to show more this and, and remember that, oh, this is not saturated. It's, it's a partial degree of saturation or unsaturated. And then there is another thing here that's only about uh, the, the suction. That's so also something not very complicated, but does change the resistance of the soil. And we should try to learn that. And I don't know. Um, uh, we are approaching now uh, the end, but there are a few more questions. Uh, one interesting question here. Uh, another one for you, Bernardo. Um, okay. Here you go. Are there any obstacles in preparing the unsaturated sample if 
we reproduce a rain over the dry soil sample for a defined period before the tests are done? Uh, yeah, a very, very interesting question. So, um, the, 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 the problem when we prepare unsaturated soils uh, for centrifuge is uh, we need to, to, to put the soil in a, in a box. So it is important uh, to, to manage the volumetric change because uh, if you have contraction of expansion or uh, expansion probably is not a problem because in, it increases the, 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 horizon, the horizontal stress. But contraction is, is, is a big problem because you, lo you lose the, 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 the horizontal stress, in fact. So uh, if, you, if you use a soil that, uh, for example, kaolin, that don't have a very big, a, a very big uh, uh, volumetric change, Yes, you can you can prepare a dry soil and then and then rain over it to to change moisture, for example. It's more it's more difficult when you dry because if you have contraction. So, Katya, um, do you, do you have any other questions or points of discussion or? I, I, just want that, I just want that uh, each one give you some advice, the final advice for for the, the, the teaching and the, the students in undergraduate level about the, the, the unsaturated soils, teaching that in the undergraduate level. Just, just a comment in connection with that. I, I can recall uh, meeting a, a student that had graduated out of my fourth year of engineering, but I'm, I met him about 12 years later, and he said, "Hello, Professor Fredlin." He says, "I remember something about your class. One thing, I had to know about effective stress in order to pass the final exam." He said, "That's all I remember from your classes." the importance of this thing called effective stress. So I, I come back to that and I still remember, if you're gonna build a science, I believe it's important to start with the stress state first. Yeah. So Bernardo and John, any final comments? Yeah, I, I think uh, I, I like your point, Jilson, about the um, assessment of the students. And um, yes, yeah, so you can teach everything and you have the framework and you try to introduce all of these concepts as they go along. But then the retention of those materials that the students have can be challenging. Um, and I think that when they do things as a hands on exercise, either laboratory or even a calculation, and sometimes from that calculation, they can see all of the um, the, the details. Like they, instead of going to a black box program, they have to calculate all of the different steps. I think those things give a lot of confidence on, on concepts like unsaturated soils. Um, and I, I think it is going to take some time for us to build up a database of, of problems and exercises that students can do in unsaturated soils, even though it's been around for many, many years, uh, yeah, I think I think there's still some room to grow on, on developing content. That is a good point. We should collaborate on that and share our questions. <laughs> Although you, you, if you share it, then the students will <laughs> also. Well, with colleagues, I mean, among yeah. colleagues, professors. Because <laughs> building a database of questions uh, in general is difficult for unsaturated soils is, is more challenging. Yeah, completely agree. Bernardo, any final comments? Well, I, uh, I think that uh, 
I, I continue with my, my, my question, which could be the, the more uh, illustrative example to deliver to the undergrad, uh, as an example, to the, to the undergrad students, in order they uh, never for, forget. And also an important problem, of course. I think uh, in certain regions of the world, expansive soils are, is, are very important. So probably to illustrate in a qualitative way, even in a qualitative way, uh, easy problems related to expansive soils could be a, could be easy to illustrate, and then and then uh, a very important problem. Claudia Zapata. Hello, Claudia. <laughs> yes. Claudia. Uh, Hi. Go ahead, Professor Fran. Yeah, it just uh, it's a very interesting point and a good point, and I I would. Um, slap the wrists of our university professors by what I'm going to say in that you know that uh, I have contact with consulting firms, engineering firms, and I find that they do a better job of modeling slope stability problems, slopes uh, in, involving unsaturated soils, seepage through unsaturated soils. They model saturated, unsaturated flow routinely in these consulting firms and then we're arguing about whether or not we can teach it at university there's something wrong here i think we need to get with it actually and um, uh, just uh, i'd like to hear the rest of your responses but i think sometimes we are being led by the consulting people not do, we should be the researchers who promote a simplified enough science so that it can be put into practice when you get out um, there's too many things we're avoiding at university, and and uh, you know we're we're responsible for giving them an adequate uh, education, even as it involves unsaturated mm -hmm. soils. And I guess the the question in the screen right now is very well connected to what you're saying. Uh, because we have to offer uh, solutions that are uh, feasible, right? And and that the the, the industry is uh, can deal with in terms of uh, the time frames. That's the main challenge. And not to mention uh, convincing them to reimburse the services in an appropriate way, right? So yeah. So catch just to, just yeah. one comment. I think it is very important that we, as geotechnical engineers, be known as the people who take soil samples and test them in the lab for our problem. We, we have been doing this since the beginning of soil mechanics. We try to get the most undisturbed samples out of the field, take them in and test them for permeability, for shear strength, and volume change. We are the people who taught the world to take soil samples and build labs into it. Now, I am biased, of course, but I would say if we're going to teach anything about unsaturated soils, it's the soil water characteristic curve or the water retention curve, whatever you call. We should spend our time. If there's one test you can do in the lab, it's the soil water characteristic curve test. Even if you get two or three points on it, you can very likely fit a sigmoidal curve through it, and it'll tell you pretty close within an order of magnitude what your air entry value is. And the air entry value and the residual value are the two anchor points that are most important for engineers to, to know about in solving practical problems. And so we should be teaching it at uh, universities. I agree. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Oh, there's a, another thing I, I think we should teach students. Uh, that they shouldn't believe in effective cohesion, 
but they can believe in a saturated cohesion, <laughs> apparent cohesion. That's it. Is uh, <laughs> I, 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 that, that's I, all that's all right. But uh, <laughs> uh, if if you write a paper or write a book, you, you got to include it, or else you'll be criticized for not including it. So <laughs> the, we want to have a more general. But I understand what you're saying. Yes. And also, we don't need many tests. If you understand the problem, and maybe one test, a good test, we help a lot. Because sometimes with all the, the things we need, we think that we need a lot of tests. And then we get, even the students, when we show so many characteristics curves, they, they get confused. So maybe, uh, but you see, Professor Frederick, that the, the characteristics curve it's not something strange for us. We saw even the, the, the Taylor books or, or the Zag book. It's something that's not new. But, the, you know, for example, sometimes the people, I don't know. I, I don't know if I, sh I should say that. But then the uh, uh, function becomes something so special that everybody wants to fit Van Knut fit as the Van Knut fit was the answer for all of those problems. And that's something that also, I think that we need to figure out that the, there is no uh, expo uh, exponential curve is not solving our problem. But the understanding of the problem is going to help us. And I think the, the, the seminar uh, is going to, to, to help a lot. I think that this is going to be recorded. So uh, I know that, for example, for John, uh, for, even for the European people, I know that summer time, but it's too late. So uh, in, in, in Canada, it's too cold. Uh, I'm in Victoria, it's warm, but it's Friday night. So uh, at the late of the work, uh, but fortunately, the ABMS is going to have this record. And I am using that for my classes. And I, I thank you very much for the, the lectures. I like very much all the lectures. I think that we did not combine, but was very well presented because the first one gave the fundamentals. And then Bernard came showing the, 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 the some tests and some results in the centrifuge that's Something that, for example, I remember when I was in Boulder, the small centrifuge in the class uh, was something so wonderful and helped a lot the, the student go to practice with the, the, the concepts and with the fundamentals. And John came with the, 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 the showing that the actually don't need a new uh, class for unsaturated soils. We should discuss more our soil mechanic, our classical soil mechanic, because the classical soil mechanic is not saturated. The classical soil mechanic is with water and moisture change. With, uh, we, and also, we are so uh, I remember that the first time that I met you, Professor, was Professor Fredner, was I was in Colorado doing my PhD, and I went to Utah. And we and was a Geo Institute conference, and there was a special in 1997, and there was a special uh, conference on unsaturated. And you opened this section, and I remember that because it was a, a section very related to the press, the oh, a lot of people, and you were so popular. And I thought, oh, unsaturated soil can be popular and can show the people that the, the people who is in the field, uh, that's important. And they, I think that uh, in that time, even the effective stress professor, uh, they remember that it's important, it's not for the only for the get grades, but for going to practice. And so I want to thank you, everybody. And Gilson, Gilson was wonderful. I, I think that if you want to do something, invite you, Gilson, because he, he is so great guy. I mean, and he, he handles things so well because sometimes I am so, 
uh, I, I, I keep looking the, the, the presentation, I forget that I, I, I want to do my job. And Gilles also, no, we need to do that, we need to do. So I thank you, Gilson, very much. And also remember, everybody, the, the Pan America Conference uh, next week. Because Bernardo started with the Pan American Conference. The first Pan American Conference was in, in, in Cartagena. And then the second one, John, John was co chair. And now it's Gilson time. So we should be next week for the Pan American Conference because it's so great to go to the, the conference on unsaturated soils because the people are so nice. And even when I went uh, in Brazil, we have also the NSAT conference. The, and Gilson was organizing one of that. It's so great. I mean, don't forget about the Pan America conference because, it, it, and I think that the, the, the webinar warm up the people for the, the Pan America conference. And we want that. So thank you very much. And Gilson, please say a few words because you organize all the, the, the webinar. Sure, thanks, Katya. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, uh, bringing up this idea of uh, organizing this uh, little uh, webinar. It's a, it was a, a great uh, opportunity. Uh, I'd like also to thank Professor Freden, Bernardo, Professor McCartney. Um, I think it was, uh, uh, the, the presentations were very interesting and they, uh, when put together, they made a, a very good set of presentations that touched in different uh, points that were complementary. Um, uh, again, uh, I would like to invite everyone who is watching uh, this seminar, this webinar, to uh, register and participate in the Pan American Conference on Unsaturated Soils. Um, we are really sorry not for not having uh, uh, a usual conference. Uh, we would really like to be in Rio right now, uh, or maybe next week, I mean. But um, I, I'm sure that the organizers, Tasio and Fernando Marinho and, and me, I can, I can tell you that we try to do our best to have a good program, an interesting program with uh, interesting um, presentations and and by the way, the proceedings, if you visit the website, the proceedings are uh, have been available for uh, some weeks now. They are open access, so uh, uh, everyone can, can download the papers and they will remain available uh, for eternity or at least for how long the, the, the web of conferences uh, system is, is available. And, and, the, and also the, the keynote speakers, they, they have contributed with papers uh, uh, that are being published by the Soils and Rocks Journal. And uh, those papers are also open access. Everyone can already start uh, visiting the website. We have about four papers already published and the remaining papers will be published in the coming weeks. So thanks, thanks a lot for all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye.